Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Should the Music Industry Be More Environmental? Um, this is our final session of the whole festival, which is super exciting. I have a hunch that we've left the best till last. Um, so yeah, nine of nine. Thank you everyone that's joined us all the way through. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we've got so much to talk about and so much to do. So I'm really quickly going to introduce each of our panelists. Um, first up we have Eva. Eva's stage name is Kitty Got Claws. And um, she's actually gonna be performing for us tonight. She's a rapper, singer, and spoken word poet. Um, her dark and impactful writing and performance intends to break the stigma surrounding mental health using stories and narratives. Um, she was a featured artist for two weeks on Camden Radio Scotland and um, has performed all, all over the place, up and down the UK. Um, she's amazing. She also curated the music for this festival. So any other musicians that you've seen over the last couple of days, that was all Eva and um, she's done an amazing job. Like, fantastic. Um, in addition to that, we've got Nigel Adams. Uh, he is the owner of the record label Full Time Hobby and team member of Music Declares Emergency. Um, so Full Time Hobby was set up by Nigel back in 2004. He met Wes when they were working for Mushroom Records, which is really cool. Um, and they're sort of inspired by labels like Jack Holzman era and Electra Records, which is really awesome. Um, and the label has always been wholly independent, so that's fantastic. I'm really excited to hear more about Music Declares Emergency, Nigel. Um, we've got Russell. Russell is a science communicator. He's doing a PhD in phytoplankton and he's an ex-physics teacher. And not many people know this about him, but he used to play in a three-piece punk band called Caution Horses. And they did three tours of Europe using public transport. Um, so he's going to be chatting about environmentalism um, and touring which is super fun. Uh, we have got Laura. Laura is a young Suffolk music student and wild swimmer. You may have seen her in a previous live stream. Um, she's a student violinist with a diverse range of interests and is planning to study um, at Guildhall School. And she's really excited about the future of creative music making and exploring ways that we can use music to spread the message. Um, and then finally, we've got River. Um, River is a 16 year old singer songwriter, trombone player and music enthusiast and he's based in Suffolk as well. An active volunteer for Extinction Rebellion, key organiser of the 2019 school strikes for climate which is really cool and I want to chat to you more about that. Um, as well as being an artist as a part of Music Declares Emergency. So I don't know if you, um, I don't know if you and Nigel have ever met, I don't know what the network is like there but maybe this is a good opportunity for you guys to, to connect. Um, he released an EP in February and um, will be releasing a single about the climate emergency from a young person's perspective, which I'm so excited to hear. Um, so yeah, that's everyone. Oh, and me, I Sophia, I'm your host. Yeah, awesome. I just like music in general. So let's, um, oh, how's the chat going? Let's see. So if you haven't already, pop in the last album that you listened to into the chat so we can get conversation going. Um, I'd be really interested to know. Uh, Goat by the Jesus Lizard this morning. Good shout, good shout. Uh, Little Dragon, New Me, Same Us from Davey. Lovely album. Grace, Taylor Swift Folklore. Nice. I, I'm not surprised, Grace. Uh, Radiohead, A Moonshaped Pool. John Hughes movie by Maisie Peace from Zoe. Yeah, a lot of love for Radiohead going on in the chat. Amazing. Okay, um, so we're going to throw a poll up on the screen. Really interested to see people's thoughts on this. Do you think there's room for improvement in of the environmental impact of the music industry? And um, I'm going to go around Palace and like in a few sentences, sort of what negatives to the environment have you come across in the music industry? And how, sh how should, it's quite a big question, isn't it? How should the music industry be more environmental? So I think it'd be really nice to come to Nigel first. Hi, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I think um, I think every area of society has got to be more environmentally minded, you know, and uh, the music industry is part of that. Um, I think there have been moves towards people really looking at it, but there's loads more that could be done. Um, but I'm also uh, I'm, I'm really wary of being too critical of any individuals, you know, it's it, 
the the problem is the system that we're all operating in um and the music industry is part of the overall system so you know the system needs to change essentially um and, and while that's happening we can be tweaking what's going on with the music industry yeah as an excellent point and it's something that's come across every environmental topic that we've covered sort of over the course of the weekend is we can make personal life improvements but when you're doing it in a in a particular system in a particular world there's only so much that we can do as individuals and it is about the system changing as a whole um and i know laura you you're quite passionate about um the climate and everything like that um what what do you think on this topic sort of music industry within the system and and the impacts on the environment of the music industry yeah i i have to agree with um what nigel just said i think um, obviously it's got to be part of a wider system change because the music industry has so many multifaceted and there's so many different areas that require improvement but it's got to be um, I guess as it's the same expectations must be met as with any other part of society. Yeah it's a really good point it's a really good point um, I think yeah Russell what what do you think on this topic what well, obviously you've got a lot of experience with touring I think I, I'm trying to kind of weigh everything up and I think it'd be very easy to it's very easy to cast aspersions and point fingers at people and say such and such needs to do better such and such needs to do better and I think one of the cleverest things that fossil fuel companies have done is make put the onus on the individual it's it's up to us as individuals to reduce our carbon footprints and the idea of a carbon footprint was actually invented by an oil company to kind of switch the focus it's up to us as individuals to reduce our plastic stuff and it shouldn't be up to individuals and i think there's far worse people and contribute like people who are doing much more environmental damage in the music industry which let's face it after covid isn't in the in the best states ever um I think that it's important, you know, just like Nigel said, that we all play a part in that. And I think I think it's important to have an awareness, but I don't think that the music industry, you know, shouldn't really be the focus of any real big campaigns or, or, or judging, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really, really good point. Um, River, what, what would you add to the conversation on this topic? Yeah, I mean... I kind of feel very similar to Russell in the sense that, um, you know, the music industry isn't necessarily responsible for, you know, a huge percentage of um, like global carbon emissions. But I, I think that the, the music industry has a very significant role in the sense that it is plays, you know, the part of a bridge between systemic change and the system and individual change in the sense that it's, you know, a huge industry that is part of, um, the system but has a direct relation and, and can really reach individuals across all ages, all genders, all races, all nations. So I think music has not necessarily an important role playing um, on a physical level to you know reduce um, emissions or be the centre of the blame for the climate crisis but has um, an important role to play being a kind of um, vessel for information and activism and messages to individuals as something that is so huge and part of such a huge system. I think that's, that's a really excellent point. Um, I think we, we've spent a lot of time this weekend as well talking about um, using creativity, using music to communicate about key environmental issues. Um, and like you say, it's, it's not a scapegoat to just be like, the music industry is the centre of all of our issues, because it's not, but it absolutely can be one of the solutions in terms of communicating with the wider audience. Um, I've just seen John's popped in. I think we had a mix up with some links that didn't get sent there. Sorry, John. Um, I will quickly introduce John. He runs Folk East and is super interested in sustainability. Um, studied art and design in Lowestoft in the early 70s. Um, and despite being a fairly rubbish singer and musician, he realised that the best way to be involved in the music industry is to stage the gigs instead of being the centre of the gigs, which I absolutely love. Um, I, think that's, I absolutely feel that. I'm training to be a dance teacher right now and I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll teach it. I can't, I can't actually be a dance teacher. Um, and yes, 
So you started Folk East in 2012 and the aim was to have a festival to showcase for all the, oh, I am reading this, for all the folk in the East, which is fantastic. Um, and nine years on, it's overwhelmingly local, but has a national draw despite Corona, um, which is fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, John. Um, Pleasure. Can you hear me? Guess, right? We're just generally having a big debate over the role of the music industry um, mm. in a sort of communicating about climate activism, but also the environmental impacts of the music industry. Um, how do you feel about that, putting on events? Well, I mean, I've just come in on the last of the last comment, and he's absolutely right. The music industry is not wholly responsible for the mess the planet's in, but it's an extremely powerful voice. I uh, mean, you can trace this right back through music over the generations, from the jazz, emergence of jazz and blues and so on. Music has influenced generations, and... At the moment, we're going through another, I think, big change in, in younger people's thinking, um, which is brilliant and, and well overdue. Um, but I think it's absolutely right that everybody in the music industry does their utmost and the best they can to try and reduce the harm we're all doing. Um, it's not easy because quite often society and systems are against you trying to do things as much as you'd like to. Um, but I think we all have a responsibility to try and do everything that we possibly can. Mm -hmm. my, my experience for all my working life is Greenfield, Greenfield events mm -hmm. in the summer and smaller indoor events in the winter months. So, and with the Greenfield events, we've made big inroads over the years into various things we do and our attitude to what we do. Um, one of the things that you, you mentioned just there was the local element. So right from the start of setting the Folk East event up and the idea of it's about the folk in the East, i.e. the people, the whole concept was that we source absolutely as much as was possible to source from as close by as you could possibly source it. So examples are the two tent companies we use One's three miles from our site, one's five miles from our site. Um, our power distribution company is about six miles from the site. But, and we, and we, this goes right through to all of the storeholders, the artists and the crafters we use. Um, the, the majority of our food stores use locally sourced, no, locally produced food. Um, but by doing this, apart from the obvious thing of cutting the road miles down, that uh, as being used to transport people and equipment to the site and back. A lot of that money then that's going round amongst those people, staying in the local economy, staying directly in the local economy. Absolutely. And and that is a big factor with all with all with everything else that we're doing. Um, so supporting it's, it's... local, I think, is an extremely environmentally sound thing for any any festival to try and do. I think that's a really good point. And it's it's really two really interesting things that you've brought up there is one, you went straight in and you, you said, you talked about the, the system that we operate under, which we already had discussed before you got here. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good that that's kind of something that everyone's kind of thinking. Um, but I think something that we've been discussing throughout this entire festival, we've talked about food, we've talked about um, nature, we've talked about all kinds of things. Something that keeps coming back round and around and around is locality. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's putting money back into the local businesses, the small businesses, mm. and reducing environmental impacts as a result, it kind of feels like a win-win. It, um, it is. It's a no-brainer, I think. I think. To be yeah. honest. Plus, you get, for, for a national audience, and one comment we had a few years ago in a review that somebody gave us was, although we're coming, people are coming from all around the country to come to the event, when you get here, you get the overwhelming sense of local. And, and I think that's because that's what the event is. It's about the local people. Yeah. I think um, I feel that especially um, in East Anglia compared to anywhere else I've lived, the sense of community is so strong. And I know Eva, you live in London and you don't quite essentially have the same sense of community. Um, how does sort of locality play into music, like music gigs and things and their environmental impacts in, in London? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know too much about gigs because I'm coming at this more from a perspective of an independent artist. So the gigs that I've really done, especially in London and well, up and down the UK as well, have just been more like smaller scale events, which will obviously have a smaller environmental impact just based on how small they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I did want to bring up though is, um, um, I feel like, yeah, there's a lot of talk of like, you know, we shouldn't blame the music industry. And it's totally true that the music industry does um, have like a much smaller um, sort of environmental impact. You know, when we look at other industries, like definitely other industries are worse, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing to criticize. Um, I think that um, one thing that I've really struggled with as an independent artist, you know, running a business, um, is merchandise and actually finding merchandise that is um uh like actually environmentally friendly there's so many niches mm -hmm. there's so many little things to think about microfibers plastic packaging um and Absolutely. especially when you look at this sort of print to order merchandise sort of economy like i have not found a single print to order merchandiser that's actually environmentally friendly if someone wants to jump in and correct me if someone can name one awesome you're helping me out but i don't think that they exist see i think this is a really good point and we had a whole live stream about sustainable fashion um yesterday um and we we had a discussion on this i want to come back to that with you later on and talk more about um merchandise in particular i think that's a really interesting topic but let's right now go into our first video which is all about music declares emergency um, it was actually made by my well ma made in collaboration with my little sister um, so I'm really excited for you guys to see it. She's a big music fan. My name's Gemma and I've been curious about the impact on the environment of the music I enjoy. In 2019, the UK music industry declared a climate and ecological emergency. Music Declares Emergency, or MDE, has 3,813 declarers, from artists, individuals, organisations such as venues, festivals, promoters and record labels. But what does declaring an emergency really mean? A climate emergency declaration refers to the act of naming a state of emergency. However, a climate emergency declaration doesn't represent any action plan. It admits the measures taken so far haven't been enough and is a commitment to make climate change action a priority. MDE's declaration covers four issues. Firstly, truth. If governments and media don't tell the public the scope and severity of climate and ecological emergency, we can't hold them to account for their actions and we can't make good choices ourselves. Having admitted the scope of the emergency, the industry want government action now to reverse losses of habitat and wildlife and reaching their net zero emissions target by 2030. This emergency didn't just happen overnight. The industry recognises that global injustices are a big part of the problem and the world has to change the systems currently in place to make long lasting and effective change. Finally, the industry acknowledges its role in the problem and commits to changing its practices urgently. And what do those changes involve? To work together, to share expertise. MDE has members who've worked on sustainability issues for a long time, like Julie's Bicycle, founded in the UK in 2006, to speak up about the emergency. We know that celebrities and social media influencers play a part in highlighting issues, and this can be useful to start conversations, change behaviour and be positive role models. To work together to make music industry businesses sustainable and regenerative, Julie's Bicycle has created a Creative Green Certification, awarding points for commitment, understanding and improvement. The programme has been running since 2012. It gives access to best practice, training, assessments and recognition. Since 2013, Julie's Bicycle has worked with Arts Council England to make sustainable practices part of the council's funding. So if you want money, you have to create an environmental policy and an action plan and report their impacts. Here are some areas that the music industry needs to tackle. Merchandising. This forms a big part of artist income. This can often come with environmental and human costs. Waste. For festivals and event venues, this is a massive issue. We all remember the shocking sight of Glastonbury clear up with abandoned tents and litter. One report stated a cost of £780,000 in 2016 and the clean up taking six weeks. The public outcry was loud and changes were made 
So in 2019, the cost was an estimated £500,000 and took four weeks. But was it enough? Touring. Obviously, this has a huge impact for the environment. But again, there are changes with artists choosing to either stop touring, such as Coldplay, using public transport like Massive Attack, information and education at venues such as Billie Eilish, or planting trees to offset impact, like the 1975. But we have all heard of these artists. The question is, can new unknown artists take these steps? Festivals, energy and water consumption, waste management and transport are some of the key areas. When summer festivals are such a large part of our culture and development of music, can the organisers do enough to justify the impact? Streaming. This might seem like the dematerialising of music, that is, going from physical records, CDs and cassettes to downloads and streaming, must have improved emissions, but this has not been the case. In 2019, the University of Glasgow published a report that shows emissions of greenhouse gases at the peak of CD sales in the year 2000, peaked at 157 million kilograms. But emissions in 2016 for storing and streaming music ran between 200 and 350 million kilograms in the USA alone. Interestingly, physical music is making a comeback. Action by the music industry is vital because as the industry itself points out, there's no music on a dead planet. It's an excellent tagline that no music on a dead planet, like is, is a fantastic point. Um, I think everyone had a chance to vote in the poll. So let's throw those results up on the screen and see everyone's general vibes yeah a lot of improvement needed 67 percent people agree uh, some improvement needed 33 percent and zero uh, percent people said no i think everything is okay which is quite a relief because um if someone didn't think that everything was okay i'd be a bit worried at this point um fantastic thanks adam um so yeah that video there's some really good points in there i think the points are streaming i didn't know that coldplay had stopped touring I'm mildly heartbroken, but um, that's okay. That shows something about my music taste. Um, so Nigel, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. Obviously musicians declaring an emergency. Is declaring an, a climate emergency effective? Um, and what does it really mean for you guys as an organization declaring this emergency? Well, it, it's the beginning, isn't it? It's the start is declaring an emergency. You're putting a, a line in the sand um and then it's what you do from from there on like the film said um but i think actually making that declaration is is planting the seed in your mind and and you know in, in the public's minds that there, that there is an emergency and then you can hold yourself to account and you can hold the industry to account because they've made that statement it's the same with uh councils and the fact that Parliament have, uh, have declared an emergency, we can then keep returning to that and using that as a, as a guideline of what needs to be done. Um, it's very easy in today's society to just lull yourself into the fact that everything's fine. You know, even in a pandemic, people go back to the normal routine and you can just lull yourself into the fact that let's just keep shopping normally, let's keep acting, let's keep doing everything the same. But in truth, like it says, music declares an emergency. We are in an emergency. We're in a climate crisis. And we have to keep circling back to that and reminding ourselves. Um, and everything flows from that. Um, in terms of what we do as a music industry, I'm, I'm part of Music Declares Emergency, and that's one step. We're also I'm also part of AIM, which is the Association of Independent Music. And as part of that, we've uh, formed the AIM Climate Group. And we meet monthly uh, as the main independent labels and we discuss what we can do. You know, we we look at every aspect of how we can change and how um, we can support each other with information. There's big labels like beggars who actually have um, someone whose full time job is to look at their, you know, their emissions, and their carbon footprint. And there's other smaller labels like, say, Brownswood or, or ourselves, kind of a medium sized label. And we can all look at every aspect of whether it's how do we improve the the chain of uh, transporting our physical goods? You know, how do we make touring better? How can we do things like, you know, we're trying to get a, um, a musician's rail card so that actually there's an impetus for people to use public transport more because half the time getting a flight, you know, is a half or a third of the cost of 
um, of, of getting the train. And, and it, it makes it socially acceptable as well, you know, if we can do those kind of things, if we can create this atmosphere around the music industry where to be more environmentally sound is socially acceptable and is aspirational, then that not only filters through to all the bands and everybody working in the music industry, but it goes out to all the public, all the fans of those bands. And then as a politician would say, it becomes soft power. You know, the world looks at other countries for their cultural impact. Um, you know, and we've always been very proud of the music industry in this country and how it affects the rest of the world. So by making these changes, you know, by declaring an emergency, we can have such a broad effect on a, on a global scale. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a good point. I think um, I'd like to hear from probably from River and Laura um, as two young musicians looking to go into the industry. Um, how do you feel about what you're about to sort of enter into and and your development within that process I, that's a kind of a, a weird question but um yeah maybe let's let's go to river first yeah um i mean it's scary going into an industry that feels so um unstable obviously because of the coronavirus and unstable in the sense that um it's easy to feel powerless, I think, um, when you're looking to be sustainable, but also knowing that so much artist revenue comes from touring. You know, like I'm an artist on Spotify and I know that I don't get, you know, I don't get paid through Spotify at all. And so I'm, you know, when I go out into the world out of education, I'm going to need to tour, to do live music, to make a living. And, um, you know, one thing that I think um, from that video um, that you showed mentioning um, the 1975 planting trees and as brilliant as I think that is I think there needs to be infrastructure in place um, where um, actions need to be accessible um, financially to smaller artists and emerging artists because not everyone has the money absolutely to, to plant trees to offset their carbon, carbon footprint. Not everyone has the money to not be able to tour. Some people rely on gigging and touring and live music um, to, to make a living, to survive. Um, so I think um, as, an, as a kind of young artist, I'm 16, so I have a few years, you know, until I go out into the world. And, and, it, and it's nerve wracking knowing that there's not the infrastructure in place to support you um when you know you've got this this duality of being so so afraid of the climate crisis and what it will mean for my generation and you know for 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 the way i live and mm. also knowing that music is you know the only thing i can do in my life and the only thing that i love and so um having to find a way of making it both work and at the moment it feels like um the infrastructure isn't in place but then with music declares emergency i'm a declaring artist i'm actually currently wearing the t-shirt um <laughs> and um oh, i thought when you put that in the chat you were wearing a coldplay t-shirt oh, oh. oh. So, so not to offend you so good but i would never never That's do fine. i'm not That's a, i'm not a coldplay <laughs> not a coldplay fan but yeah i'm wearing the uh, tom york stanley dunwood uh, no music on a dead planet um design but yeah um i think I think change is happening, but definitely infrastructure needs to be in place to support emerging artists. I think it's a really, really good point. Um, Laura, is there anything that you wanted to add on to what River's put there? I think River said it very well, but um, yeah, I think there's definitely a conflict between obviously wanting to um, make a living in an already um, unstable um, industry and then also kind of following your own morals and at the same time being really creative with it but I do think that um, this links back to the argument about music as a like River said a vessel for communication and I think um, that can possibly um, come into the whole debate about it um, and I think that's definitely something I'm going to bear in mind um, when I'm creating. Mm. Oh yeah, all excellent, excellent points. I think this is a really fantastic conversation for us to be having right now. Um, I'm going to throw another poll up at the screen for people at home. I'm just going to let's have a look at some comments. 
Uh, Davey says, yeah, it needs to be accessible for all musicians. Good point. Um, all levels of success to stream music is lowest paid for any musician. Um, I don't know who said that, but this is smart. Get a musician's rail card going, which is a lovely idea. Um, yeah, uh, so there should be a poll coming up on your screen now. Yep, yeah, what do we think is the worst environmental impact? I think this is a tricky one. Um, I was saying to these guys just before we started going live, my entire degree is environmental management and we try to work out the impacts of everything environmental and it's so hard to calculate, but roughly, what do we think? Throw your thoughts in there. Um, and while you're doing that, I'd like to chat to Russell because I know, Russell, you calculated the the carbon footprint of the tours that you did. Yeah, so we our first tour that we did and we played... Uh, we drove from the UK across Europe and we went as far east as Serbia. And that was three bands in one van. And this was just like a giant belching diesel van. It wasn't like, it wasn't awful, but it wasn't particularly great. And so we drove 3,000 miles in total. And that total trip made about 1.2 tons of carbon, which actually isn't that much <laughs> which surprised me and I, I i did all my mpg stats using the most unfriendly van i could find so uh, there was eight of us in that van uh so that was basically uh, 150 kilograms of carbon for every person for that whole tour which worked out at about the same uh, 0.13 tons of carbon per gig because obviously if a gig is a different length of time you're like okay so essentially I, I i want to make out like this is really driven by envir environmental things but essentially we found touring in the van was really expensive and it meant that we visited all these countries but we didn't we just spent the whole time in the van so we thought you know is there a way that we can bring costs down uh while actually getting to see the country a bit more and so this led us to the idea of public transport so we did a tour of just the Balkan states. Uh, so we did um, Bosnia, Croatia, uh, Slovenia, Hungary, uh, Serbia, around there. Uh, so what we did is we flew with our instruments to, um, to Croatia, and then we used public transport to get around. So you think, okay, they've flown a little distance, but then does that offset? And the thing is, is that flight, just that short flight, made more carbon than the whole of the 3,000 mile journey driving in a van. Wow. Which, but then once we were there, we only emitted for, we, we traveled over a, a thousand miles on public transport and we emitted 0 0.05 tons of carbon. So, okay. so hardly, so once we were there, so both tours t made uh, the, the same amount of, of carbon, roughly. Uh, the, in fact, the flying one was slightly more. So but okay, then that's mind-blowing. Yeah. So then you start looking at things like, okay, so I was thinking of Ramstein, like what, what show is like ridiculously over the top. And if you're not familiar with Ramstein, big heavy metal band, and they have pyrotechnics, and it must take them a week to set up that stage. And like that's a giant touring behemoth but, i mean realistically we were playing to you know 50 to 100 people at every gig a night whereas ramstein are obviously playing to god knows how like like thousands of people every night so if you look at it in terms of like carbon per person as opposed to not from the band but from the audience that you're interacting with is that a way of kind of allowing for that i don't know there yeah, absolutely. And it comes back to the whole locality thing that we were discussing with John, doesn't it, as well? You've got people travelling all over the country for gigs. I know some like big musicians will come do do one, two gigs in London and people will travel from like the entirety of the UK to go and see it. And you're not taking into account their emissions as well. Whereas maybe smaller, more local gigs, you're emitting more carbon yourself, but the people coming to see you are emitting less. So it's an interesting balance. Um, John, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on this, um, like what you think the worst environmental impact is of, of potentially like organising your festivals, because we've spoken a lot about how you've minimised this through locality. Um, 
I guess kind of what I'm asking is like to be a little bit self-critical and be like, what what do you think the worst thing is, and where where else could you potentially like improve with Folk East? I guess. Um, there's a lot of work to do. We you'll, we'll never get them festivals carbon neutral. Uh, the the biggest element of our carbon footprint is literally people getting mm. to and from the event. Um, if you do a pie chart, about 75 to 80 percent of that chart is literally the transport getting to and from the event, whether it's the audience, the artists, the staff, the crew, that is by far the biggest emitter. Um, and I was on a, a conference last week for the Association of Festival Organisers Conference. There was a big debate about a lot of this. And somebody was talking about when, when the, the electric car overtakes the combustion engine about putting charging points on site. And I kind of, pointed out a case of where are you providing the power for these car charging points? Because if you're going to charge electric cars from diesel generators, you're kind of wasting your time. You're, you're not getting anywhere doing that. So there's a sort of plan afoot to try and use the the power that's not... On a festival site, 24 hours a day, you have to have some generators running for things legally for things like food stores to keep fridges and freezers running. Mm -hmm. Overnight, those generators are sitting there running to do their legal capacity but there's spare capacity on them so if you start getting your mindset around okay why we've got those let's use that capacity for something else it's not it's not losing the carbon footprint but it is it is helping it, it, it's it's trying to to do your best i suppose to to cut down what you can but i, I think the whole concept of people are going to travel somewhere to go and see a lot of entertainment Absolutely. It's going to have a carbon effect, whatever you do. Um, I think it would be an absolute possibility to have a carbon neutral festival. One of our stages has been solar powered from the start. Oh, wow. OK, that's fantastic. You know, we, we've, we've, done it, we've done a lot and there's still a lot of work to do. I mean, it's every year we look at what we do. We look at the facts and the figures and the data we've collected. We've managed to consistently cut our use of, uh, of diesel down on our generation by using intelligent generators for several years so we're now from four years ago we're using half the amount of generators on site smaller sets mostly we've almost half the amount of diesel we use but we're still actually powering the same things and it's only because it's working where the loads are around the site and balancing it yeah um, i think can i, can I just quickly point out because there's something has got something nigel said about the train ticket i don't know if it's still in existence there used to be a thing called entertainment express and it was a, a rail ticket system that the theatre industry used to use for getting actors and technicians around the country. And it used to exist. And I don't know if it still does, but if, if it doesn't, okay. bringing it back would be a really, really good idea. There's a top tip for all you young musicians on this. Um, let's go have a, look, have a look at that. Amazing. Thank you, John. Um, a couple of comments coming through in the chat, like a hugely honest response from John. Makes a really good point. Work smarter, not harder. If you need to use the energy get the best out of it that you can um yeah all fantastic points absolutely and then a couple more so shocked to hear about the real impact of flying never want to get on plane again um which is a whole mood um so eva we were chatting about merchandise um actually before we go into merchandise let's quickly see the results of the poll um up on the screen if that's okay with you adam i've, cha I've changed my order there um, we've got 50% of people think the festivals are the worst environmental impact. 33% think it's touring and 1% think it's waste. And I think waste is a fantastic issue. There's a whole live stream that we did earlier on waste. If anyone wants to go and learn a bit more about that. Um, but I don't think we'll have time to cover it in this one. Um, thanks guys for that. Um, Eva. Yeah. So we were chatting about merchandise and obviously the music industry, um, relies a lot on merchandising to fund things, um, selling t-shirts, selling badges, pins, etc. Um, I know that I earn my fair share of merch and every, you know, every tour has a different t-shirt or every gig has a different t-shirt. Um, you're struggling to find sustainable ways of doing this in a sort of affordable way. Sort of what, what have you, um, explored so far? So essentially, um, so I'm currently getting a degree in music business. So this is like, I have that backing as well. But um, 
so I'm I'm trying. So basically, everything that I've heard through my degree, everything that I've heard just through research has been: if you're a small artist, you need to do print to order merchandise. Um, actually, and print to order basically means you know you have it on a website. People, um, you know, they 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 don't actually produce the merchandise unless um, somebody says like, yeah, I want to buy that, and then they make it. And actually, that seems like a better environmental option as well. Like, we're not having this excess stock that gets mm -hmm. just thrown away. Or, you know, I mean, it's hard for a t-shirt to, like, go moldy, but I'm sure that happens eventually. Um, yeah, but um, so for smaller artists, we're not having a lot of traffic, you know, like early career, mid-career artists. We're not having huge amounts of people visiting them, our online merchandise store. And within COVID, online merchandise store is really the only way to do this. Um, so we need to do print to order every single print to order merchandise you know platform that i've looked at does not take you know sustainability of the environment into consideration um thank you nigel for putting that i will definitely look into it um it's it's hard because you know in and no shade to my university but in the degree like we are definitely not um the, the main i feel like the main uh, point that is driven home to us is like profitability mm. over um, actually making things um, sustainably and running our business sustainably. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's like you said, the, the cost of doing it as a smaller artist is so much greater, but you are so much more reliant on the income from merchandise. It's kind of like a negative circle really, isn't it? And it's when you get to the bigger artists and they're like, yeah, it's all organic and like there's no flavors. And da, 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 da. It's like, it's great for them because they've got the ability to do it. Um, it's a problem with um, bigger artists as well. Like I just the, en the entertainment industry in general, like I've met YouTubers that I pointed out to them that um, they should maybe think about, you know, is your merchandise like ethical? Is it environmentally yeah. sustainable? And I will not name him, but I had a big, <laughs> but I had a big YouTuber tell me that he didn't realize merchandise could not be environmentally sustainable. And I'm like, oh my god! Oh, this is it, isn't it? Look up we to need you. to talk about it more. Like we need to get this discussion going in the right circles and and reaching out to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, we're gonna move on. Well, we've got another video now. Um, Festival Vision 2025 provided by Julie's Bicycles who was mentioned um, earlier in the first video we showed. We've got Faye in the chat going, oh, Spill, who was it? <laughs> maybe, maybe even we'll direct message you on Instagram later, Faye. <laughs> I'll put you in touch. Um, yeah, so let's, let's roll the next video, that's. It's time to act. The music industry inspires millions of people around the world. We're also responsible for vast amounts of emissions and mountains of waste and pointless plastic. By tackling our environmental impacts and shouting about what we can do, we can assist in the change that is needed to make a difference. Every one of us has a role to play. Every one of us can make a contribution. It's our responsibility to respond. Everything we do and you do really does matter. So what can we actually do? We need to change the way we do business. Reach out, inspire artists, inspire audiences, lead by example, innovate and change. Vision 2025 is the industry response to the climate crisis. We need to keep going and keep leading the way on this and showing people that we as an industry can make a real massive difference. Dance music has the opportunity to lead the way and needs to. Together we're, we're, we're much more powerful and there's much more scope to create change. Music is a huge force for good in the world and we have a huge amount of power if we use our voices. Without these issues there is no music industry or any other industry. Join the movement and let's create a sustainable industry together.
Amazing. I think that really um, reinforces what we were literally just talking about, which is shout about it, join the movement, talk to your friends, start those conversations. Um, so it looks fantastic. So we've moved into this sort of weird world of digital gigs and online content like today. Um, we have been saying this through the whole festival. It's been beautiful sunshine outside and a whole, our whole thing is get out and about and, and enjoy the sunshine, um, but also tune into our festival and, and, and sit in front of your screen. Um, can the music industry survive on digital gigs is the question. And also I kind of want to elaborate on that in a way that, do you think we're gonna to move to a hybrid way of working in the future? Are we gonna to move to this sort of model where, yeah, live music and live gigs exist, but they're also gonna be online as well in a digital world. Um, Nigel, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you make a really good point there. I think hybrid could potentially be the way forward. Um, I started working with a band from Australia and we put their album out right in the middle of COVID. And um, we had a great agent on board. They booked them a tour, which we then had to cancel. Uh, booked them another tour and actually the venues went up a bit. Uh, had to cancel that, booked them again. And the venue sizes went up because we'd put the album out and the whole process had happened. So actually, fortuitously, the venues actually increased and they'd been able to get on without a smaller part of touring without even coming over. Uh, they did some online shows, you know, and there was a lot of other kind of online online activity driving what was going on and it did make me think that maybe rather than having to actually slog it out completely and play every single venue you can have a hybrid where you know you can really focus on the online thing do some really great well put together uh, digital shows and then put in the live shows around that I, re I really think there's a way to do it and I think for some artists as well that might be great for their mental health rather than feeling they've got to really slog out as hard as some of them have been doing you know if you can get that balance it could be great for for artists sam for you know the environment yeah it's a really good point that um the mental health point as well because touring is intense and when you're doing a show every night and you're traveling all day um it really does take its toll um so why was I going with that? I can't remember. Oh yeah, so we were chatting beforehand, weren't we, about vinyls and CDs and cassettes and how potentially they have less of an environmental impact than streaming in terms of carbon emissions, but definitely not in terms of um, plastic use and things like that. Um, a couple of you had really good points on it and I can't remember who it was that said them. I think Eva was one and Russell was the other. Russell, do you wanna go first? Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, what was I? What was I? Uh, yeah. Well, obviously, the internet makes loads and loads of uh, loads of emissions that I was even realizing. And every time we send an email, and that contributes to it. Streaming contributes to it. And having these giant banks of servers uh, all over the world, trying and needing to cool them down. There's a reason that Facebook moved its servers to Sweden from California. Uh, in the last couple of years to try and so it's not causing as many carbon uh, emissions to keep the servers cool so just because you're doing something digitally doesn't absolve you but there's um, and obviously you know vinyl is one of those things that's just stabilized and it, everyone foresaw that it was going to go the way of the dodo and that's come back and i posted a link uh at the beginning of the chat here of a, an, a cornish artist called nick mulvey who actually has been printing uh, vinyls on recycled beach plastic that there's been taken off the off the beaches of cornwall which is quite nice and it would be good to get into a situation where that's not a novelty item and that's actually a, a, just a standard that actually you've got these things i mean vinyls are uh you know recyclable it's pvc uh, at the end of the day so yeah let's let's just re recycle the vinyl cds are harder to recycle because they're composite materials from what i gather but um you know no one no one uses those really anymore but uh yeah so mm. that's that's what i would say about that it's super cool uh, turning turning beach plastic into into things is something that i've been obsessed with for a very long time is amazing and um, we've got some good points coming through in the chat 
um digital gigs can be better for the mental health of the audience as well sometimes people don't like big crowds at festivals and concerts and but they really want to go and support their artists which is a fantastic point from zoe um and we've got river backing that up as well it's really important to consider when we have these discussions um i think i've got one final question for you guys and i'm happy for anyone to pitch in so just wave wave at me on the screen um but things are pretty rubbish right now for the music industry everyone is kind of at their wits end it's been almost a year um i know that if i have to sit here and watch another digital gig i might tear my hair out because i love them but i want to support everyone but it's just like i want to be in that crowd at the same time so what's the best thing that we can do to support the music industry as we go through boris's six step six seven step four step plan to june the 21st potentially hopefully um anyone want to speak i can't see anyone waving Oh, uh, let's go to John. Oh, uh, unmute yourself, John. Dunk. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've been sitting, as I said earlier, sitting on quite a few of these these festival Zoom meetings with a lot of other festival organisers. And the general consensus about Boris's uh, roadmap is, is that we're probably unlikely to just be back to totally normal after June the 21st. Um, there's going to be caveats attached and a lot of festivals are kind of planning um, more COVID secure versions of their events and sure. expecting... That's a good question actually. Uh, is Focus going ahead? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we, we are sticking with the plan we'd already done before the, Boris's last announcement, which is a reduced numbers, COVID secure or as COVID secure as you can make it event so we're simplifying the, the site layout um, so it's easy to keep people in a kind of one-way system. Um, so it's easy for stewards to manage and easier for, easier for our audience to deal with. Um, we're going to do that because even with the, 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 the kind of sets of regulations they're suggesting is going to come out in the May announcement. If we base it on only up to 4,000 people a day, we can work on that. Um, the... The thing, the thing is the DCMS are going to start running these pilots at the end of April and throughout May, various different styles, event and festival, including some sports events. Um, and the data they collect from that is what's going to become part of the conditions that come out on the 21st of June. And to be quite honest, I don't think anybody realistically expecting on the 21st of June, again, that's it, it's all over, we can all go back to normal. I don't... I, I think you're right, and I'm heartbroken. This year, to be quite honest, I think there's going yeah. to be social distancing, if some form, in place for a, quite a while yet. Um, but there's there's ways there's ways we can we can do it. I just just quickly like to add a point on the, the streaming. Um, certainly, from our point of view, a festival we're looking at it being part of our accessible plan mm -hmm. for this year, especially. We we've done a survey, and, and there's. A, it's gone out generally in the industry, the festival's done this, but about 30% of the people have been surveyed of saying they still don't feel confident to come back to a festival this year. They probably won't. They'll leave it another year. Um, and so streaming this year or part streaming some of the event is a very good way for the people who don't feel confident to come back yet and be amongst the, the crowds or people who have access issues. Yeah. Well, to still access the event. So we're looking at the streaming very much as a tool in that kind of sense, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really lovely we've brought so much from an accessibility um, conversation into this because it, does, it wasn't talked about enough beforehand, but being able to see that people can do things online during COVID has really increased accessibility for a lot of people. And I mean, there's people in the chat um, talking about strobe lights at events and how that makes it inaccessible for for lots of people, um, all that kind of thing. Nigel, I think you raised your hand there. Um, you wanted to chat about supporting the music industry post Corona. Well, I, you know, I suppose, you know, supporting bands, buying on Bandcamp, you know, uh, if there are digital gigs, trying to support those, go to them. Um, all those things really add up and, and just, you know, gi giving your, your general support to bands and showing them that you still, you know, really care and want to connect with them is, is all really important. Yeah, 
absolutely. And I think um, in a second when we we're going to hear have to hear some music from Eva. Um, I know Folk East is in August, so um, someone behind the scenes will, will drop, drop a, a link to Folk East in the chat. And all you amazing music artists, um, please go and, and drop links to your band camps and your sound clouds um, in the chat so that we can all go and follow and, and show some love. Um, so I'm going to throw a poll up on the screen real quick. Um, just how you found the session. Has it supported um, your understanding of the topic? Um, did, it, yeah, did it further your understanding? Um, and whilst you guys are doing that, oh no, yeah, no, we'll, we'll leave that on the screen for 30 seconds. Oh, there's a question in the chat from Laura. Are streaming emissions just due to, due to the way energy is sourced? It's a great question. Anyone want to answer? Russell might be a good person to answer that one. Uh, it's... it's the impact of streaming down to how the energy is sourced mm. uh i guess partially i mean it's electricity and anything that's run on that i mean uh as we found out from the last session on renewables that actually it's about reducing our overall energy use as opposed to like oh it's okay that absolves me because it's green power and that actually a lot of green powers aren't necessarily that green and come with other do they just shift the problem somewhere else uh so i think things like i mean microsoft have most recently been looking at storing loads of their servers in the deep ocean which is really really cool and obviously water is a really high thermal conductivity so that takes a lot of the heat away as well but um yeah being for the time being, I think, uh, until people move their servers and things to more sustainable places, I think, unfortunately, yeah, uh, okay. trying to, yeah, use it less. Uh, yeah, awesome. I mean, Laura, was that the response that you were expecting? Yeah, um, I will have uh, watched the renewable session. I'm sure it's been recorded. Um, and I was thinking about how um, if, if it's due to the energy consumption, then people are generally um, streaming a lot more online, especially at this time. So I guess um, to, to a certain extent that um, consumption could be, I guess, attributed to the, the consumers rather than the, the music industry, because people are going to be using the internet to stream entertainment because they want yeah absolutely i think it's, it's a really good point i mean we use the internet to stream everything i don't really think that music is the worst like the worst thing that we should be streaming we're all if i'm not listening to ed sheeran i am probably just going to be watching netflix and it's all still streaming through the internet so what is yeah anyway um river was there anything that you wanted to, to add on that kind of topic of streaming I think, I mean, everything's been covered really well. I think um, one thing is kind of similar to what was mentioned earlier about local local live music. Um, a great, um, you know, revolution that this um, virus has brought us in the music industry is like the globalisation of music and, you know, the fact that we can have concerts that people from across the world can join in a super sustainable way. Um, I heard an interesting quote, which I don't know if I agree with, but I'll put it out there. I mean, I haven't, I haven't thought about it or researched it, um, but um, local gigs, at, um, go to your local gigs. And um, if you want non-local music, go to online gigs, which, was an interesting point i don't know how i feel about it i genuinely haven't thought about it um but i think it's an interesting thing to think about and um yeah i mean i don't know much about the streaming world but i think one thing that needs to be considered is we've talked about um financial you know the financial um, aspect of this debate which it's taboo, but it really shouldn't be ignored, um, in my opinion. Mm. And streaming, um, a, lo a, a lot of people go to Spotify and go to um, streaming sites that we consider to be, you know, not great for artists and t like financially. 
are what people can afford and if people are consuming music they need if people want to consume music then they need to be able to consume music so i think it's important to have the infrastructure in place that everyone can access the music they need um in a way that works for them that's sustainable that pays the artist yeah i don't really know the answer but i think um you know music can't become a class war music can't become um div divided from people who have the money and the status and you know um ability to offset their carbon footprint so it has to it has to be something that everyone can access whether you're a small artist a big artist a small um you know you know whatever it is that's what i think absolutely i think you make a very good point about the class war um because we've watched so many other things sort of descend into class wars um i'm going to throw the poll results up on screen real quick um and yeah we might not know the answers to that question river but it's worth asking it regardless um yes definitely 86 percent um and we also had 40 percent say i'd love a longer session which you never know it might happen one day um if someone funds us um excellent thank you let's um Let's go over to Eva in that case. Eva's going to play us out with some music and poetry.
mic really quickly so I'm just gonna mute of course I didn't mute <laughs> I'm so sorry right poem time poem time <laughs> oh Jesus um yeah so that ukulele is notorious for going a little bit out of tune um because I need to restring it which is entirely my fault. Uh, but you know, that's the way it goes. Okay, so this next poem that I'm going to do is basically all about depression and the climate and capitalism. And if you know any sociology, Theodora Dorno, but if you don't, don't worry. <laughs> right, <laughs> let's go. Rotten food is all I am. Unworn shoes is all I am. The bailiffs came and took away all that defines me. I was indebted to my stress and so they cleaned out my insides until I was emptied entirely. An unfinished sculpture is all I am. A forgotten hunk of rock with half a meaning, paint peeling, abandoned without reason, an artist's death is all I am. 
There's no space in this place for junk like me. I waste the air I breathe. Since the bailiffs emptied me, I waste the air I breathe. Since the sculptor forgot me, I waste the air I breathe. Find me in the darkness, under rocks like wood lice, sleeping through the day and grieving through the night. Find me in the void, where nothingness is everything. Find me in an empty space where no one thinks to look, but don't try to find me. That would be ill-advised. I may become the bailiff that empties out your mind. I may become the sculptor that leaves you behind. I may become the reason that you cannot sleep at night. I've fallen out with my reflection. Not enough to land me in a section, but enough to leave me restless. I'm second guessing every phrase that I say. Guess I should never speak at all, cause that will save me the pain. I build a pillow fort higher than a skyscraper. I wanna hide away and really that's just my nature. I try saviour every moment spent in isolation and I scribble out my suffering onto lying paper. My fear plummets and cuts up my stomach like razors. Depression is the biggest time waster, but my sorrow has a nice flavour. So I indulge until I'm bulging and I'm dizzy like an ice skater. A kind saviour once told me to take it easy, but every moment idle and I'm frightful, it makes me queasy. P please believe me though, no matter the remedy, there's no medicine to fix what I'm meant to be mentally. Was I meant to suffer? I don't think that was the intention of my mother when she carried me. Out there there's a parallel universe with a better me, but I'm stuck with the bad of me, running low on batteries. Love's a cult and the forest's on fire. I'm being sold a solution wrapped in plastic, packaged with barbed wire. I'm being sold depression in the form of fake lips, makeup, facelifts and fake bumps. Fake faces make my smile fake. Doctored bodies make me visit the doctor because I'd rather an empty plate. I'm being sold vitamin D from a bright light. <laughs> this is true. From a bright light, an advertising board that lights my flat up through the night. I'm being sold the solution to climate change with a vegan, not yet recyclable, non-GMO, anarchy-friendly handbag, which is free of dairy, gluten, parabens, sulfate, still got microbeads, but we're planning to get rid of them by around the time the sun explodes. No bugs, no defects, definitely no wrinkles, no leather, no pleather, single use, but you can use it three times if it's a lunar eclipse. No nutrients, no carbs, no insecurities, no judgment, and it's sponsored by Coca-Cola. I get it. That's not only the solution to climate change, that's the solution to my depression. The cure to my depression is my vegan, not yet recyclable, non-GMO, anarchy-friendly handbag, which is free of dairy, gluten, parabens, sulfate, still got microbeads, but we're planning to get rid of them by the time the sun explodes. No bugs, no defects, definitely no wrinkles, no leather, no pleather, single use, but you can use it three times if it's a lunar eclipse. No nutrients, no carbs, no insecurities, no judgment, and it's sponsored by Coca-Cola. <laughs> I'm being sold companionship in a time of separation. The marketing department hates it when I feel amazing. My urge to purchase, impulse purchase, pity purchase, pain purchase, paranoia purchase, that all hinges on my depression. Fake faces standardized the nation. Theodore Adorno wasn't great and his thoughts on jazz were downright racist, but at least he understood the basics. Standard products make standard people. And I agree business is evil and yet I run one and yet depression runs through me. Am I a symptom of the zeitgeist or just a symptom of my history? Will my vegan handbag save me? Maybe, until it breaks. There's just not enough in this world that permeates. When I look at myself as an unfinished sculpture with bumps and cracks and deformities, I wonder, was I ever supposed to be a sculpture? Or was I supposed to be a person? With flesh and blood that pumps and runs, not gray and cold and draped in a stained curtain. I think I was supposed to be real, a real girl with acne and cellulite and pores and wrinkles and sickness. I wasn't supposed to glow. I wasn't supposed to be my own witness and critic in endless pictures. Who are the bailiffs that emptied my brain? Are you like me? Are we the same? Am I seeing it too simple or did I overcomplicate? <laughs> Rotten food is all I am. Unworn shoes is all I am. The bailiffs came and took away all that defines me. I was indebted to my stress and so they cleaned out my insides until I was emptied entirely. That's it. <laughs> oh my goodness, that was amazing. Thank you so much for that. That's, I think it's um, really resonated with a lot of us in the chat. Everything you've just said. Uh, I did have, I did have a comment message going, now I feel bad about my vegan handbag. <laughs> So I thought it was quite funny. <laughs> um, <coughs> oh, <coughs> choked now. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you so much for um, all the work you did creating this festival. Thank you to every single panellist on this event. Um, you've all been amazing. Thank you for your contributions. I think we've had a really interesting discussion. Um, I've got to say some other thank yous for some people behind the scene. 
um god let me not miss anyone that would be awkward so um adam who's been running all the tech for this event and dan who's done so much in the run-up and so much with the tech for all the other events you guys are amazing check out isolation station um gina who is a creative genius um and i can't even put into words how the amount of input she has had in how these streams have ended up looking ian who is just magical on every single level um he's done so much work with the website with press with everything speaking of press zoe our press officer has been fantastic she's been running things over on instagram as well um on social media we've had grace on twitter we've had my little sister posting on facebook it's really been a huge team effort um and to our other hosts um over the weekend russell and abby you guys have been amazing thank you so so much for all your hard work um god someone put it in the chat if i've missed someone please because that would be so embarrassing um i'm gonna throw it to zoe real quick who's just gonna see us out and then we'll have an, an outro video thank you so much yeah so i'm just here to say thank you basically to everyone again and to everyone who got involved um your contribution definitely means so much to us um siren is all about building a community of like-minded people who can support one another i think that is something we definitely accomplished this weekend um, make sure to sign up to our mailing list so you don't miss out on any of future events. And make sure to go follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at It's Sirens Calling. I'm sure someone will pop the link in the chat. Um, and also we are an almost entirely volunteer based not for profit community organisation and we run off donations and grants. So if you have anything spare, please do help us out. Donate at, I think it's a PayPal at Incred Oceans, which again is in the chat. Um, and yeah head over to our socials so we can carry on the conversation. Mm -hmm.